Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to our War in the Pacific Admirals Edition Let's Play series with Lieutenant Rainbow Slash. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at the combat replay for April 11th, and then we're going to be looking at the sort of orders phase for April 12th. Uh, as you may remember last turn, the Japanese did land some troops on Port Blair, so that is a key base uh, near, I guess, in the Bay of Bengal or Indian Ocean. I'm not quite sure where the boundaries differ there, but basically it's a base that would allow him to, th to threaten our supply line into Burma and really put a, uh, a crimp on all of our operations along the Indian coast, not necessarily shutting them down, but giving him recon and other things like that over some very vital areas. So that's something we've got to kind of keep an eye on and see how that develops this turn. I also did make the decision to go ahead with a shock attack at Cyan in China. So we will, or not, sorry, not, not a shock attack, a, a deliberate attack at Cyan in China. I'm not quite sure what the enemy force is there. Um, I'm estimating it's a couple of brigades, but if it's larger than that, we may deal with a bloody repulse. Either way, a lot of bloodshed coming in Japan, or sorry, in China this turn. Captain Flack, thanks for the bits, and the Japanese are bombarding off the coast of, coast of Borneo with some heavy cruisers. We were trying to get some of our troops out there by taking one of those lightly defended coastal bases back from the Japanese. They're also bombarding in the southern tip of the Dutch East Indies, apparently. So we'll have to see. Seems like they've got some heavy cruisers. Oh, multiple heavy cruisers there. So we've spotted at least three Japanese heavy cruisers on bar bombardment missions this turn so pretty active turn for some of their heavier naval assets giving us a little bit of intelligence about where they are we haven't seen any heavy cruisers in a while so that does give us some some info on on where some of the heavier units of the japanese fleet are um, we have spotted the minikidu butai at singapore i don't think it's left singapore at least as of our last uh, intelligence so we'll see if maybe they make an appearance pushing toward blair or or not um all right, so we're through the, the PM, or sort of the, the early morning night phase, and we're going to go ahead and move into the day air operation phase, air operation AM, and we'll see what that has in store for us. No carriers have been sunk so far, Admiral Akbar's. Uh, we haven't even had any carrier versus carrier battles. We've spotted the Japanese mini Kitabutai at Singapore, like I said. Our carrier fleet is on the way to Colombo. It's getting pretty close, and we also sent a British carrier out of Colombo uh, to head down to... Uh, threaten the Japanese invasion force at Port Blair. So we sent a British carrier task force with just a single British carrier and some Albacore uh, biplanes to see if they can't attack the Japanese shipping near Port Blair, uh, supporting that invasion. Meanwhile, the Japanese are continuing their strategic and tactical bombing over Batavia. They're hitting our runways there, 33 G3M2 Nels, bombing from 20,000 feet. They were lower before, so it seems like maybe the flak has done enough damage to him that he's decided to elevate those attacks to slightly less dangerous altitudes. Uh, more bombing hits from the Sallies, so 15 more Sallies coming in here. Six of them damaged. It's saying he's hitting the runway here with two hits and a supply hit with one, so the supply hit matters. That'll reduce our ability to defend there. And also a couple of hurricanes damaged, one destroyed on the ground. We do still have quite a few aircraft in the Dutch East Indies, uh, several fighter units there as well. We used them bombing some Japanese shipping a turn or so ago uh, with some light bombs, and they did quite a bit of, uh, of damage. You know, I kind of wish I had them up on cap this turn, because I think the bombers came through, but I didn't see any Japanese sweeping fighters who might have been able to get some easy kills there. Okay, some Nels hitting some troops near Borneo. Alright, so a few Oscars coming in on escort, but it seems really light in the... Uh, fighter department near Batavia. Maybe we'll see if we can't exploit that. I don't know how many fighters we'll have available to us next turn. Probably just a handful, especially with all that bombing going on. Some mop-up bombing in the northern tip of Sumatra. Uh, Japanese bombers are... Okay, this is interesting. Oh no, this is our corps that had been driven. So we had a corps of troops that had been along the supply line near Hankow along the railway. They got driven back by Japanese troops, and so they've been pushed back toward Ichang. They're basically a spent force. Uh, and they're just sort of mopping up and hitting them. But that's the first Japanese air we've seen in China in a few turns, I think. So maybe he's moving some of his units back there. Okay, some bombing of our troops at Batan. Interesting that he's not hitting our troops at Clark Field, though, because that's where the vast majority of our troops are. I suppose he could be going for supply at Batan, but little does he know we don't have any supply at Batan. 
Bataan. Our troops at the front have all the supply that really exists, and Bataan's supply depots are pretty much empty. We're ready to starve in the Philippines. Okay, so three Sonya's damage there. He's gonna continue bombing us at, uh, at Bataan there, so go ahead and waste your bombs on basically empty supply depots. Quite a few sort of mop-up or, or small unit bombing raids this turn. Also interesting that he's trying to bomb our troops north of the river here in central China. That's a level 5 fort that he's hitting with defensive terrain that the Japanese tried to cross there. It would be very bloody indeed for them, so hopefully they don't anytime soon. We did decide to go ahead and bomb his troops, <laughs> interestingly enough, on the same exact turn. Um, maybe for the same reason he's bombing us, is I wanted to try and get some intelligence on what the Japanese might have across the river here. So you can see we're hitting the 37th Division south of the city. I didn't quite see which division, I'll have to go back and look at the replay, is north of the city. But that tells us there's at least a division off of the side of the city, so um, I don't know that I would want to take the, the bloodbath of crossing the river there. Meanwhile, 8 B-17s and 21 Blenheim 4s are hitting Japanese troops at Cyan. I diverted the bombers from hitting the tanks to going ahead and hitting the enemy troops at Cyan before we send our troops across the trenches. Pretty effective bombing raid there, too. 144 Japanese casualties, one squad destroyed, 16 disabled. That should help with our attack, I would hope. Meanwhile, we are attacking the 48th Division here, so we know there's at least a division of Japanese army troops uh, that are marching west toward Pegu. They're trying to cross the river into this terrain up here. We are marching our own troops to cut them off to try and hold to prevent Pegu from being flanked and the entire Rang Rangoon line being flanked, which would be pretty disastrous. One, it would cut the rail line to China. That would be bad for supplies. Two, it could bottle up the bulk of our forces in Burma or force a speedy withdrawal to the north if we allow him to do that. And so I am marching two divisions, I think, northeast here uh, to the east of Pegu to get out in front of whatever Japanese force is headed this way. My gut says it's two divisions. It looks like it is two divisions based on this intelligence. We can see here the 21st and 48th Japanese divisions appear to be marching across that river. If we can get in position ahead of them, I think we've got a chance since they'll have to shock attack across the river, uh, but we won't be dug in or anything like that, so we'll have to see. The bombers on our end should slow the Japanese down, though. Meanwhile, another bombing attack here at Cyan, another 17 Japanese casualties ahead of our attack, a third bombing attack here, six more fortresses coming in, and another 20 Japanese casualties hit in this attack. So a lot of bombing attacks going on in China in this particular turn. Okay. All right, so we've got a carrier strike going on. Our five dive bomber, or five biplane albacores hitting Japanese shipping, pulling back, it looks like, from Blair. It looks like they're attacking Japanese patrol boats, uh, which I believe might be, I think they had one cargo ship and one patrol boat that wasn't sunk by uh, our submarines in the previous day's attack. And so it looks like we've put one bomb hit into the Kinso Maru, suffering heavy fires and heavy damage, and three bomb hits into the Yamagai Maru, three bomb hits, and it is sunk. So two patrol boats attacked there, one for sure sunk, the second either sunk or will be sinking soon, hopefully. We did just get some water sinking sound effects, so I'm wondering if that Japanese patrol boat there sank uh, after the attack. Okay, so we're into the PM air operation phase. I'm gonna go ahead and fast forward through some of the recon stuff. Okay, so Japanese delivered attack here south of the river, south of Yan'an. Remember, we crossed this river in an effort to uh, force the Japanese to continue to spread out their infantry. It does look like they've got the 40th Division, which is almost at full strength. It's closer probably to about 80% strength based on these attack values. And then the 36th Division, so, and that's at even better strength. So the 36th and the 40th Infantry Divisions are here, as well as a fair bit of artillery here as a blocking force and some engineer units. So the bad thing is we're going to get shattered. The good thing is any units that are destroyed will end up getting respawned in Chongqing uh, with a third of their infantry strength for free. But the bad news is that we'll then, if we do get destroyed there, will allow him to either drive north toward Yan'an or will allow him to transfer these troops west along the railway toward Cyan. Either way, though, they're several weeks out of any meaningful uh, threat to either direction. 
You can see it looks like the 40th Division lost a fair bit of assault value, about 20 squads there, so at least in terms of suppression or, or effective attacking. They got 3 to 1 odds, they pushed us back, they lost 347 troops, 30 squads either destroyed or disabled. We lost 5,447 troops, 172 squads destroyed or disabled, all but 7 of those destroyed. Um, so quite a few casualties here for the Chinese troops. All six units were treated. Nobody was destroyed, uh, but that is uh, not the best result for us, although we had fought there the previous turn as well, and uh, things didn't go well. So, hey, I guess one thing is it's a drain on Japanese supplies and resources in China. Meanwhile, the obligatory bombardment at Quilin, um, they're continuing to try and bombard us there. They've actually increased their force here to five full divisions and two army headquarters unit, although only one artillery unit, so they really don't have the artillery to push us back there, and you can see um, even even with the assault value before, you know, if they were on the offensive, they don't even have more assault value than our defensive forces here, so we could pull three cores out and still be fine, but that bombardment doesn't appear to have done any meaningful damage to the troops. Japanese bombardment attack here at Batavia. You can see here they have quite a bit more artillery, although most of these are mortar units, um, and then they've got... Elements of the 18th Division. Did we see the 18th Division somewhere else this turn? I thought we did. I thought it was somewhere like in Burma, but maybe that was a different division. Maybe it was the 28th. And then they've got the 38th and 5th Divisions in their entirety, both just shy of 500 Assault Valley. These are strong units here. Um, the Bombardment at Batavia. We'll see how it goes. We are outnumbered in Assault... So his Assault Valley is 200 better than ours. But the bombardment didn't go well for him. He lost one squad destroyed, two disabled. We lost two disabled. And he also lost one non-combatant. So our counter-battery fire was pretty damn effective. He needs more artillery there. Uh, they're not they're not doing their job. Um, Japanese deliberate attack at Tijlap. This is like the third turn that the 144th and 24th infantry regiments are attacking there. And they still fail to take that base. The defenders at Tijlap are putting up a remarkable resistance here. 255 casualties on our end. One squad destroyed, 27 disabled. He lost a lot less, only 96 casualties and 7 disabled. But in, en in any event, another attack at Tijlap. More supplies consumed, more units sort of exhausted and beat up, and no success. Here comes the moment of truth. Japanese deliberate attack at Port Blair. They've got a naval guard unit as well as it looks like they brought in the rest of the third SNLF unit, which had been pair dropped. Uh, it does not look good for our troops all at zero at the moment for assault value. So yeah, they're going to get four to one. They're going to capture the base on that initial attack. Our Viper force is a small unit of commandos, a few Gloucester uh, troops who we tried to bring in via aircraft this turn and they took the port. They didn't even need to wear the forts down. So Port Blair does fall to the Japanese. That is going to change the situation in the Indian Ocean. Uh, we lose about 1,100 casualties uh, with all three of those units destroyed. Japanese only lose 86, and so that's going to be that's going to be a challenge for us to continue supplying Rangoon. We can try and hug the coast of India and Burma and probably still get some supplies in, but that's not a great situation there. Meanwhile, a whole bunch of Japanese Naval Guard units attacking the 73rd Filipino Army Division. Uh, at Bacalod, and that's another success for the Japanese. Our troops do retreat. I don't know where they're retreating to. It looks like there's a dot base over there, I guess. And uh, 400 casualties for us, 44 for the Japanese. This has been a good day for the Japanese ground forces so far in this turn. All right, so we're going to have another attack. Naval Guards units here at, uh, at Sampit, 8 to 1 odds. Our troops are treated into a, into a bit of a buzzsaw, although somehow our troops are outnumbered two to one. Or, yeah, our troops are outnumbered two to one. Three, eight to one assault odds, and somehow they lose 46 men and we lose nothing? Okay. <laughs> okay, and here comes the deliberate attack at Cyan. Oh, boy. Okay, so I did not know the Japanese have an armored unit, a ninth, the 9th Armored Car Company. Probably no tanks in there, so that's good. They also have the 41st Infantry Division. It looks like it's pretty much a fresh infantry division, north of 400 assault value. So that's not great. In addition to a full-blown infantry division, they have four infantry brigades, one of them at nearly 200 assault value. So we'll see how this goes. Jack, I probably can't counterattack at Blair. At least not for a while. I don't have the resources to do an amphibious assault. All of our units there surrender. But this is going to be a big one, folks. You can see the 41st Infantry Division is a very strong. We do have a lot of troops attacking here. 
And one of the bad things in this case is I'm attacking, which means I'm going to consume a lot of supply. I'm already kind of low on supply at Cyan, so we are probably going to be in a critical supply situation after this battle. But if we can cripple a Japanese infantry division and some, some brigades, it might be worth it. You can see currently the cores are bombarding and attacking. We'll go ahead and fast forward through here a bit. Okay, so... Yes! We drove them back. All right, so... I don't know if you guys caught that, but the infantry division was below 100 assault by us. So it looks like that infantry division lost 75% of its strength. The almost 200 assault value infantry brigade lost, I think, about 60 or 70 squads, it looked like. So we outnumbered them heavily in adjusted assault bay, 4 to 1. We ended up with 9 to 1 assault odds on a deliberate attack. The defender was in bad... The defender apparently did not have good experience or preparation, so those units are not ready for combat. 12,000 Japanese casualties, 317 infantry squads destroyed. That is almost a division. Another division of disabled combat infantry squads. And so over 700 uh, infantry squads either destroyed or disabled. Now, on the downside, we did lose 631 squads disabled. That is rough, but only 46 of those are destroyed. So some of those guys will live to see another day. If we can pull damaged units back to areas where there's supply, that's always a bit of a dicey proposition in China. But in theory, um, we didn't lose very many destroyed. He lost 700 squads destroyed or disabled. That's better than 100 more than us total. And then when you factor in the, the destroyed, much heavier. Also, he lost 158 non-combatant like support or other type of squads destroyed. We only lost one. He lost 116 support or other squads disabled. We only lost 50. He lost 10 engineer squads destroyed. We lost five. He lost 34 engineer units disabled. We only lost, well, we lost 36. But the engineers are more important from a attacking fortifications perspective. So those losses mean more to him. They also lost 45 guns, 25 of those, or sorry, 45 guns, 25 of those destroyed. So that's nice. I'll have to, you know, dig into his pools to replace those. We lost 23 and uh, 23 lost one, only one of those destroyed though. So that's good. We didn't lose much heavy equipment and he lost 30 vehicles, nine of those destroyed. So that armored car company probably absolutely savaged seven units of his retreat uh, and a successful attack there. So a very good attack at Cyan helps to counter, I think, the disastrous situation in Port Blair to some extent. I mean, that division's probably wrecked for a month and a half, two months or so. Granted, Japan has a lot of divisions in China. It's not like this materially changes the strategic picture there. But it does buy us more time at Cyan, buys the troops north of Cyan, trying to dig in on the approaches to Chungking more time. Um, and maybe we'll make him a little bit more cautious. We'll see. He's got that armored spearhead still driving in from the east. So we'll see uh, We'll see how that, that plays out. But a slaughter of 12,000 Japanese troops in China, trying to make China the Spanish ulcer of the Japanese invasion or the eastern front uh, for Japan, if you will. Uh, the German eastern front, obviously, and then and that's sort of that mantra. Um, so trying to trying to keep up the, the body count uh, against the Japanese invaders there. Every unit of supply that he has to use, every squad that he has to use, reinforcing units in China, replacing units in China is supply he can't dump into his air industry. There's supply and resources he can't dump into defending the Pacific Islands. Everything we do there helps everywhere else. Can I bomb Port Blair? We could. We could also use some battleships that we have uh, at Colombo to try and bombard his um, his base there to make sure that he can't use it as a as an airfield. So let's go ahead and jump in and take a look. First thing I want to take a look at is Cyan. So obviously we drove his troops back there. Looks like we drove uh, all those other three units that had been moving north must have arrived, I think, or he told them to stop moving. So the armored formation with the 1,500 assault vehicles is still 92 miles to the east. The infantry to the south of Cyan is not moving this turn. Supply situation in Cyan, not so great. We have 78 supply in reserve. 24,000 supplies required. And you can see a lot of our units here are low on supply. So even like these really good infantry corps, they're 200 shy of their basic needs. So that's not great. I wouldn't say supply is critical yet. They're all still like 60% or better. 
and there are things we can do to conserve supply for a few turns, I think, at Cyan to make sure that we um, are not, uh, you know, that maybe we can get a little bit of, a little bit caught up. So Cyan does produce its own supply as well. Produces 60 a day. That's it. Jeez. Um, but Langkau produces some of its own also to the north. Um, and then we can probably draw some of the supply down these major roads. I'm also hoping, and I'm not sure, these are very minor roads, but we have plenty of supply in Chongqing, so I'm hoping some of the supply will get filtered across the mountains to us. But I'm not sure if it works that way, so we'll have to see. We also do have another core moving back to Cyan, another 200 assault value. We were at about 3,600, I think it was, assault value before the attack, so we didn't actually... We only lost about 200 assault value despite all of those disabled units um, and whatnot. Most of our cores are still in pretty good shape. Some of these guys have uh, have a little bit lower numbers. The 38th core, a lot of disabled troops. I would wonder if it would make sense to pull some of these guys back to one lesson. Like if, if there's a couple of weaker cores, maybe we can look through like, I don't know, the 43rd core. Well, they're actually not that weak in terms of disabled versus ready. Maybe the 38th core would be an example um, where we would take them and move them across the mountains to Chungking where they could rest and refit uh, while also lessening the supply burden at Cyan. That's something maybe I'd consider. But um, overall, I think we're still in good shape. 3,400 assault value um, and over 700 guns here. Uh, the city itself, what's its fort level? It's at four. So we got the fortifications up to four. I think the concern with this enemy armor here as they move, move west, they haven't started... I'm, I'm looking as close as I can. It does not look like they've started moving north. So one thing I'm worried about is probably when they get to this here, to the one hex east of Cyan, what I'm worried they will do is they will send the armor north and then west and cut Cyan off. Now we can slow them down enough that our marching can outpace them if we hit them with air power, but that they could surround Cyan and this entire force and then cause us to be, you know, destroyed, most likely, or at least the majority of our units lost. So that's something we've got to be careful that we don't allow them to flank. They could have started moving here because there is an exit to the northeast, but there's no receiving point there. So the best place for them to do it is here, just east of Cyan, and then they can move north and they can try and cut Cyan off. I'm really curious what they elect to do, though, because with those troops of theirs southeast of Cyan now so badly bloodied, it would be a little bit, it would be risky, I think, for them to send an armored formation to surround Cyan with an infantry formation that was absolutely ripped to shreds and is probably, you know, we could hold these guys in place with a fraction of our troops while we move the rest of our infantry north. Um, it is clear terrain, so the armor might rip us apart. But I don't know. I mean, like, we could also move some infantry north of Cyan here so they have to shock attack across a river. Granted, I don't have anyone dug in there. Clear terrain against armor, not the greatest thing. But, like, if infantry goes on the offensive against armor, it does have a chance. That's the thing. On the defense of Chinese infantry and clear terrain is going to get rolled by Japanese armor without fortifications or anything to help them. But on the offensive, they can actually destroy unsupported armor fairly effective. So uh, effectively, so I'm not sure we'll have to keep bombing this armor to slow them down, destroy what we can. But overall, pretty good results in China and the force at Cyan is is in pretty good shape. Still 3400 assault value. Actually, now that I think about it, we probably did lose 600 assault value, but we did have two of those three cores because there were three cores here all at about 200 assault value. So we probably did lose about 600 assault value between the destroyed and disrupted. We just got 400 reinforcements. That makes it look less bad. Meanwhile, we're digging into the northeast um, uh, for northeast of, or sorry, northwest of Cyan in these mountains to prevent them from swinging west and driving down to Chongqing. So a lot of this defense at Cyan is about sort of holding as long as we can until we can pull back into the mountains. Okay, so I am also kind of curious about his whole, why was he reconning at, uh, at Chiki Kong? Why was he bombing our troops there? That's a first. We have 3,600 assault value there, basically the same strength as what we had at Cyan, and level 10 forts. In addition to the level 10 forts, it's defensive terrain. So it's times five for defense for the forts, times two for the terrain. Uh, he would not want to attack here. Where he may want to attack is we're a little bit weaker to the northeast of Cyan. So this terrain here is still rough terrain, 
And our troops are dug in somewhat, but we don't have anything more than level three forts. Now, the engineers can't reduce those forts, so that makes this non-base hex more interesting. But we have a thousand less assault value here and uh, and less fortifications as well. So this is kind of the weak spot here, just to the northeast of Chikikang. Now, if he brings enough engineers, Chikikang could be more vulnerable. But if he just brings a strong force, northeast may be more vulnerable. Meanwhile, we saw it, I believe, was it two divisions that we saw moving from Chiang Mai? At least one for sure. I think it said two divisions moving west here to try and cross the river northeast of our formation here. We've got a uh, full, two full divisions on the move, the 17th Indian and the 7th Australian. The 7th Australian is one of our best divisions. They've made about 26 miles progress in two days in terms of marching. I really hope we beat the Japanese across this river and into position because it is jungle terrain, so it does give us uh, some defensive bonuses. We also did move the 254th um, Armored Brigade here into position, and so we're going to move them into combat formation with their Stuart Light Tanks. They could help chew these guys up a little bit. Um, their experience is pretty low at 33, but they do have a good uh, good complement of equipment, so about 114 assault value there. They're, they're kind of a weak unit. They're, they've got strong equipment but weak training. Um, and then we've got another, again, the seventh is going to be the really critical one. That's at, they're 20 miles away. So probably two more days for them to get there. Um, wait, where's the, yeah, these guys are about two more days as well. I don't, I'm hoping he can't move it. So he doesn't have a direct linkage here. He doesn't have, it doesn't look like this particular hex has an exit point to the west. So I'm hoping that will make them slower to move this way than our own troops because they got to cross those mountains. So... We'll see. Um, meanwhile, Port Blair fell, obviously. You can still see some ships moving south, I'm assuming, here. Um, our carrier group here, these uh, the HMS Formidable, is the one who launched the Albacores last turn uh, to sink those Japanese patrol boats. Um, so you can see it looks like, I'm guessing, it was the, eight, eight, the 818 Squadron, I'm guessing, because some of these guys gained experience. Um, History of the Great War, thanks for the resub. Appreciate the support. But you can see here that uh, these guys did destroy a couple of Japanese patrol boats. Meanwhile, my fleet carriers are getting ever closer to Colombo, I think. Where are they? So there's one group. Where's the other? Oh, they're here. And we were going to send some cargo ships out so we could replenish them at sea also. So I think that's these guys. They didn't quite link up, did they? Oh, but we got the fuel to them, didn't we? Yeah, it looks like these guys got replenished at sea. Well, the carriers are only at 50 and 40%, so maybe not. But in any event, so the carriers are here. I mean, with Blair falling, I'm not quite sure what the next best option is. Um, you know, if they were to put shit planes on Blair right away, that would be concerning because we've got a brigade of troops coming in here, the 23rd Infantry Brigade with the British Army. It's literally right by Port Blair. Um, without a whole lot of uh, warship escort too, so that's a little concerning. I think we'll need to keep this carrier group around here or divert the heavy cruisers to the escort of these guys. But um, yeah, he did get a very small amount of detection on the carrier group, a one of one. We also have some supply heading into Rangoon. We have some su supply currently unloading at Rangoon. What's the supply situation there right now? 72,000 in Rangoon, 13,000 at Pegu. A battleship attack on Blair to wreck it? Yeah, Jack, we can try that. The problem is keeping something like that closed is difficult in that sort of a isolated position without the ability to, like, quickly reload on, like, little Andaman with some ammunition ships or something like that. Looks like he upped the amount of bombers at Bangkok, so that is good to know. He has 108 auxiliary aircraft, 42 bombers, and 33 fighters at Bangkok. So that tells me he may have moved some naval bombers into Bangkok to begin closing the supply lines into Rangoon. We may have to pull some fighters back from China to defend that. But that's, that's a considerable force, especially if any of those auxiliaries are bombers. Okay... I also am thinking we may start converting some of our lighter bombers like Hudson's or um, something like that into supply transports for Cyan until we can get the supplies up a little bit more. We'll have to see, though. I'm not sure how much bombing these two divisions will slow them down, but we did bomb them. 
He's also bringing in more troops, two more units. Looks like 20 guns and 28 AFVs. There's got to be some troops in there to Molman. So he may be trying to make a two-pronged push from on Pegu. Not sure. Meanwhile, at Batavia, despite those bombardments, our garrison strength is still at over 1,000. Assault value here, not much disruption or fatigue on any of these units. So I think that's going pretty well. Our air units... Um, 35 out of 43 aircraft ready, so that's a pretty good ready rate. Nine of our Warhawks are ready. Only two Hurricanes, though. So we may need to pull this squadron back. We could withdraw them, and then they'll come back, I think, in like 60 days. And if we lose Batavia, they'll come back off map, so that might be something to consider. So I only have 11 fighters, it looks like, ready for action at Batavia. So there's that. Um, we already looked at our carriers. Supply situation at Clark Field is not great. You can see a lot of these units are completely out of supply, or a couple are completely out of supply. A lot of them are really low. Our largest division is almost at full strength, but we're going to start starving out here. We've got, like, literally nothing to come back at Batavia, or at Batan, to come up to help. No sign of other Japanese warships, as far as I can see. 44th Indian Brigade has four squads still cut off here. We have pulled a portion of the brigade out, six squads and 16 support. I'd love to get these other four squads out. Stop pulling support out. I've got some float planes evacuating some troops there. Two ships spotted moving west. Okay. A heavy cruiser and some destroyers spotted at Tana. Interesting. We do have some Dauntless dive bombers. They can't fly that far. We've got 57 fighters on Fiji. And then we've got 26 medium bombers. Six, a range of six for the Havocs, and the B-26s have a range of 11. These guys are at 13. So if these guys move east at all for like a, a run on Fiji, we could potentially get these guys. Yeah, Akbar, they took North Car Nor New Caledonia a while ago. Okay. We did counterattack and retook Baker Island from them. They had taken that, but they've also taken Canton Island. So I I think that's about the extent of the stuff to look at. Let's take a look at the intelligence report. One air-to-air -air loss for Japan, three op losses. We lost two on ops, one on the ground. They flew 4,200 sorties today, so pretty active turn for their aircraft. We lost two pilots KIA. I don't think any of those were our aces or anything. Um, ship sunk. I think we got one patrol boat, probably two. It's interesting that the patrol boats are worth 10 victory points. I thought you'd get like a million of those as Japan. I mean, they are a, 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 a useful anti-submarine warfare vessel so losing those does hurt for them but I think they did lose two despite it only saying one and yeah so ground unit replacements I guess ground reinforcement schedule let's take a look we have some units coming on in three days Second Australian Army Headquarters, the 770 or the 176 USAAF Base Force. Where's March Field? Where the hell's March Field? Second USN CBs at Port Human, and then RAF 223 Group Base Force at Aden. And then Southwest uh, HQ in six days at Brisbane. 
Okay. So I was wondering, like, I think Douglas MacArthur is still technically at the headquarters in Bataan. And I... Oh, no, he's not. Wait, where is he? I think he's still technically here. And it was going to be, like, stupidly expensive to try and change the commander of this headquarter unit. It would be 200 political points. But it looks like he automatically gets switched to the Southwest Pacific when that headquarters comes online. So that'll be nice to get him out of there for free. Hey, crack lord, thanks. So that'll be good to see. Um, ship availability, what's coming online soon? I, had to, I don't think I looked at that last episode. Cargo ship tomorrow, heavy cruiser in three days at Cape Town, light cruiser for the U.S. at Balboa in three days. Quite a few ships coming online, several troop transports at Balboa, but you can see a whole bunch of ships coming online in three days. Marchfield's in California. Thanks, Dutchman. I was going to take a look, but that uh, that's all I need to know. It's in California. Okay. And then we are in the process. We did pull, I think, was at the 28th Division? Put it on ships somewhere? Or 27th Infantry Division and two field artillery batteries. Um, it's moving off map. Uh, I think we're sending them to Burma. Um, the Americal Division, meanwhile... We refueled them in southern Australia, and they're in the process of swinging around the southern tip of Australia toward Burma as well. So the three British infantry brigades are on their way to India, although with Blair falling, that makes it a little bit concerning whether they can get there safely or not, um, as well as two American infantry divisions. The Americal, which was nicknamed or named such for their time on New Caledonia, and then uh, the uh, 27th Infantry Division uh, would give us a very potent force in Burma, and if Burma falls and they arrive too late, it will give us uh, a strong blocking force to keep India safe. So I think that's a good situation there. We get rid of MacArthur when the Philippines falls? I don't think we get rid of him, though, Koa. It, based on what I was seeing here, the Southwest Pacific Headquarters has him in command. So the game must, unless there's duplicate MacArthur's, which I don't think there are, um, the game is going to automatically transfer him. So I don't think he'll be part of that force that surrenders. Because if we look at the ground reinforcement schedule, you can see here the Southwest Pacific Headquarters is Commander General MacArthur. So presumably that means he will he will be moved. Um, I don't think any of those individuals were... Uh, we're named Douglas MacArthur. It says Douglas right there. So, anyway, um, I think that's all the big stuff this turn. It's a little bit of a shorter one. We're not done yet, though. We're going to do a little bit of Grand Tactician the Civil War. But with that being said, we're going to go ahead and wrap this episode up here. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of War in the Pacific Admirals Edition, episode number 128 in this long-running series. Uh, a big victory in China, a defeat in the Indian Ocean, and a carrier strike, even if it was just against a couple of patrol boats. Until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying once again, thank you very much for watching, and I'm out.